Welcome everybody to this plenary session about the Victorian Socialists. Yay. This time two weeks ago, many of us were on a booth in the far-flung suburbs of the northern reaches of Melbourne, handing out how to vote cards from 7am until 6pm that night. And went and met again and, and went for many hours into the evening talking about the results of what has been an amazing campaign for this new socialist elect electoral ticket. So it's wonderful then to, two weeks later, be here to come together to discuss those results as part of this conference where we can situate every step that we take as part of the broader socialist and working class movement. So our three speakers today are, have all been centrally involved in the Victorian Socialists. And I'm going to ask them to come up uh, one by one and talk about different aspects of the campaign and how we see this project. Our first speaker is Liz Walsh, who was the campaign coordinator for the Victorian Socialists. Our second speaker is Steve Jolly, the, the man that we campaigned uh, to, uh, to be the first socialist elected to, uh, to parliament, who it looks like, I don't think I'm spoiling uh, the, uh, the end of the story to say it will not be the case this time, but nonetheless something that we will be fighting for uh, uh, in future elections. And our final speaker is Jerem Small, who is the industrial organiser of Socialist Alternative and was our candidate uh, in the Broadmeadows district. So, Please make our first speaker, Liz Walsh, very welcome. Uh, thanks, everyone. Well, the Victorian Socialist Project uh, was very much established because we see the Labor Party and the Greens as no genuine uh, left-wing alternative, that uh, neither of them are really up to the task when it comes to advancing working class interests uh, to building a fighting combative left that can take on the far right uh, and then can take up the broader struggles uh, against inequality, against oppression, that can really shake up the system and really challenge the status quo. We think neither of them up to the task and that we actually need to establish something new. So just firstly on the Labor Party, uh, with the state election, I'm sure all of us here were very pleased uh, to see the Liberal Party get a thumping. Every one of us were happy uh, to see that their reactionary campaign, their campaign uh, of uh, panics about crime, their campaign vilifying migrants, their campaign of more and more authoritarian measures was rejected, that it didn't actually whip the Australian and the Victorian public up into a frenzy. Uh, so, uh, so we're pleased you know, to see the fact that uh, Labor were re-elected. But I think it is important for us to make a distinction between uh, the swing towards Labor and enthusiasm for uh, the Labor Party. If any of you were campaigning out on uh, the booths in the northern suburbs or doing the door knocking, you know that there was a sense of resignation, a sense that, of course, you're not going to vote for the party of big business, the party of racism, but, you know, so you're going to vote Labor, but you do it uh, with quite a dig, uh, deal of resignation, a, deal, a great deal of sense that nothing really is actually going to change uh, for the better. In fact, probably the most widespread sentiment that exists is a general sense that all of the political parties are self-serving, all of them are about lining their own pockets and the pockets of corporations, none of them actually represent ordinary people's interests. And, you know, you've got to go and get your name ticked off, sure, return the Labor government, um, but that's about it. And we don't see... You know, it's not a Corbyn-like phenomenon, uh, the Dan Andrews, uh, Red Dan's, you know, uh, so-called uh, progressive government. There isn't, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people 
flooding into the Labor Party, joining up, signing up, going out there and campaigning hard uh, for the Labor Party. They really have to rest on their uh, connections to the trade union movement, in particular the trade union officialdom, who you know wheel out their sort of um, you know their organisers and shop stewards and so on to really staff the ballot um, the ballot booths. They have to pay people essentially to get um, the vote out. And why would there be all this enthusiasm for Labor? In the northern suburbs, there is uh, a real squeeze happening on working class living standards. Uh, there's the cost of living pressures, the skyrocketing electricity, uh, the skyrocketing gas and other utility bills. There's the fact that wages have flatlined and stagnating, uh, the fact that there's growing precarity and casualisation. You know, all of these things are creating real pressures on, on working class people's lives. And what does the Labor Party have to offer in terms of addressing these questions? When it comes to housing affordability, what are they doing? They're selling off public housing and they're doing nothing to build you know, affordable housing. Uh, when it comes to renters and renters' rights, they talk about uh, things that are superficial reforms, being able to hang uh, picture frames on your walls, being able to have pets, all the things that you know, we should have and we're for those reforms, but none of them actually tackle the heart of uh, the crisis of ha housing affordability, the whole question about rent, and we were for uh, freezing rent. When it comes to electricity, they talk, uh, they've put out memes talking about how you know, the Kennett era uh, was disastrous for working class people because of privatisation, the selling off um, of electricity, the selling off of gas to private uh, companies. But then what's their proposal? Their proposal is to use their website to fish around for uh, which private company is going to give you the best deal and you can get $50 for that. Again, a gimmick, nothing to actually tackle the root of the problem. Indeed, the Labor Party have actually done nothing to reverse the privatisation agenda of the Kennett era and they're continuing it with the selling off of the Port of Melbourne, the selling off of the land registry, the selling off of public housing that I mentioned earlier. Um, their support for toll roads, for public-private partnerships, actually private partnerships with companies that are uh, anti-union, that are not for actually having uh, standard union conditions on, on construction sites. And then when it comes to the question of law and order, you know, the central centrepiece of the Liberal Party's campaign, what did the Labor Party have as an alternative to that? They didn't drive the vilification of, of migrants and Muslims. It wasn't, uh, they weren't the ones writing the editorials in the front pages of the Herald Sun uh, and campaigning hard on it. But nonetheless, they capitulated to it by implementing concretely uh, a toughening up of, uh, of, of people's, uh, you know, of, of a cracking down really of civil liberties and an expansion of the prison system. So we're actually seeing over the last year in Victoria an increase in the prison population by 7%. There's 500 more prisoners uh, in Red Dan State than there was last year. We're seeing draconian anti-protest laws. We're seeing draconian laws when it comes to the rights to bail, to, to parole and to sentencing. We've seen massive increases in the police. We've seen uh, the police given massive amounts of money for high-tech weaponry to police us all. Uh, and obscenely, uh, we've seen children locked up in adult prisons. Most of these people are Indigenous children and they have been essentially tortured, held in solitary confinement. And the Dan Andrews government has backed this up and defended it down the line. One of the things about the Greens is they seem absolutely disinterested in actually trying to connect with uh, people in the sort of blue collar working class suburbs of the north. We spent weeks door knocking and uh, speaking to people on ballot booths and most of that time there was absolutely zero Greens people out in the northern suburbs. The whole of their campaign was concentrated on the inner city, on places like Wills uh, and Northcote, Melbourne and Paran. Uh, choosing Paran and Melbourne as two of their centrepieces for their elections give you a bit of a sense of you know, the real retreat of the Greens into essentially an inner city sort of middle class uh, party, a party of progressive professionals, a party uh, as someone called of the woke bourgeoisie, but not a party of you know, a combative working class trying to uh, shake up the system and, and fight for their rights. Paran is one of the most wealthiest of electorates. Melbourne is one of the most wealthiest of electorates. 40% of residents there are professionals. 14% are managers. Uh, they have half the rate of tradies that, of other electorates. So that really gives you a feel for the kind of audience that they're trying to relate to. Uh, also, when you look at their candidates, uh, one of the things actually, interestingly, uh, I was looking back over some of the green statements from when they were sort of first getting going. In 2002, Kerry Nettle actually spoke to a conference quite like this. She's a New South Wales Green Senator and she spoke to Mar uh, our Marxism conference and she said of the Greens MPs that our MPs are community activists first. 
And you can really see the value of that compared to those who come in with a professional sense, with a legal sense, or with a medical sense. And when you think about the Greens candidates today, they are not community activists. In fact, most of them are doctors, most of them are lawyers, most of them are NGO kind of middle class do-gooder types uh, and that kind of compassionate technocrat. Um, so that's sort of the sort of people that they put forward. And then politics-wise, it's all about you know, a more modern, fairer, more forward thinking, not left nor right, but just forward um, type of politics, talking about values. Um, instead of actually talking about when it comes to combating racism, it's not just a question that racism is terrible and bad and that it injures people's lives. It's actually that it's a tool for the ruling class to divide people. It hurts working class people. Working class people have an interest in fighting racism. And if we're going to fight racism, we also need to put forward a class program about what is the alternative? How will we improve our living standards? It's not migrants and refugees who are um, cutting our penalty rates, making us casuals, you know, cutting funding to, to um, our services. Actually, it's those in, in political power and it's those uh, in the corporate boardrooms. We actually need a way of challenging those people. So that kind of politics could actually speak to working class people, whereas the Greens very much um, have a sort of focus on sort of a soft liberal uh, type of politics. Um, over the years, I think the, the Greens have very much uh, conservatised, and a big part of that uh, has been their electoral success. Very much the focus is on getting parliamentarians and everything else is subordinated to that. So much more a party of careerists. Um, but also, the party has uh, waged a war on the left within their own ranks. They've made it very clear that this party is not a party for left-wing activists. In fact, when there was sort of a small, tiny uh, attempt to, to challenge the, the Greens' leadership to say that there should be an anti-capitalist program when it comes to fighting for the environment, you know, the carbon tax or various attacks on working class people are not going to um, suffice. What we need is anti-capitalist politics. Uh, that was um, one of the left renewals arguments. And the response of Dean Natale and Bob Brown, the leadership of the Greens, was to say that this is ridiculous and that these people should go and try and find a new political home because they've got no place uh, in the Greens. There's also been not just, you know, attack on left renewal, there was attack on Lee Rhiannon, who was basically driven out of the party. She was the most prominent left-wing MP in New South Wales, uh, a senator. Uh, we've also seen what happened to Alex Bartel as well, who, you know, was uh, very much of more of a social... Uh, um, social justice activist, someone we see regularly at demonstrations, unlike most Greens MPs who might come to speak for five minutes and then, uh, then, uh, then run away. Uh, she was also, you know, had her campaign sabotaged, attacked by the right within the Greens. Uh, and I think that, you know, one of the things is both, you know, the sort of approach to trying to be responsible, mainstream, pragmatic managers of the system, that you can trust us with the balance of power, and that's an argument uh, to the top end of town. Uh, it's also about their general politics, their liberalism, and they have absolutely no orientation to organising and working within the trade union movement to try and have class politics at the centre of how you try and change society. So with the Victorian socialists, we thought that it was possible that we would be able to uh, start to establish a socialist electoral force that could both relate to and win over sections of the inner city left, people who do have progressive politics, but that that didn't have to be at the expense of relating to and winning over sections of working class people in the northern suburbs. And I think that the electoral results have been good. They've actually shown that it is possible uh, to begin to build up uh, an audience that we could get in places like Clifton Hill, 18% uh, in one of the booths, uh, but we could also get over 10% uh, and 11% in some of the booths in Broadmeadows. The Victorian Socialist doesn't want to be a party of wannabe politicians, and we made, great, um, made a, a, a great deal out of the promise that all of our candidates, if elected, would only accept an average worker's wage. And that wasn't just some sort of populist, anti-politician kind of statement. It was also an argument that the kind of people that we are going to back are going to be people with a real track record of fighting for working class people, being activists, of being rabble rousers, uh, not professional politicians. Uh, and we saw actually winning a, um, an MP in, in the Victorian Parliament as not just an end in itself, that then that MP would go about lobbying and writing up policy and so on. Actually, the point of getting an, a, a socialist MP in Parliament is so that they can be um, a voice for all of the union struggles, all of the community struggles, all of the, the fightbacks that are happening to show solidarity, to encourage them, to encourage people to join them. That, 
And that sort of says something about, I think, uh, the very different approach that socialists have to political change. It is important that you contest elections, that we actually make a socialist argument within the electoral sphere when, when millions of people are turning their mind to politics and thinking about who they support uh, and what, um, what would actually take forward their interests. We want to insert in those uh, political debates in society a class argument, a socialist argument. But also, we want to, uh, to use the elections and use parliament as a platform for building on struggles because we know that actually parliament is not the central terrain for how we win social change. Actually, mostly social change happens through the collective struggles, uh, people disrupting, sitting in, going on strike, uh, rioting and so on. This is actually how real social change happens. It's through the collective actions of ordinary people. And we want a champion in parliament that can back those struggles up. When we've been looking at the Yellow Shirts uh, movement, Yellow Shirts, the Yellow Vests movement uh, in, in France, we've been absolutely inspired. You know, we've seen uh, the way that the determined struggle of people on the streets facing off the cops um, has forced the Macron government, the French uh, president, to back down to make concessions uh, and how it started to draw in broader and broader layers of oppressed people to fight and raise uh, their own demands. If you can imagine, if something like that happened in Victoria, and clearly we're a long way from that, what would be the response of uh, Dan Andrews and Labor? They would be bringing out their police with their high-tech weaponry to be, uh, to be attacking those protests, and they'd be condemning them. The Greens would probably be feeling pretty squeamish about them. You know, they'd be hand-wringing and thinking, oh, all the destruction of property, uh, instead of having a strident defence of those protesters uh, and attempt to actually drive it forward. And that's why we want to actually establish a serious uh, socialist electoral force. We have contested these elections. We've been able to draw in hundreds of people to hand out. We've been able to talk to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people through the whole of the campaign. And we've been able to find a small audience for us. But this is really just the beginning and we want to continue to build on the momentum that we have for the Victorian Socialists and to show that we're here to stay and we're going to continue uh, to put forward a real challenge to Labor and the Greens. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to hand around a contact list to sign up to the Victorian Socialists. So if you're not a member yet, even if you helped hand out on um, election day, or this is the first uh, time you've come to something um, from about the Victorian Socialists, please join uh, so that we can be stronger for what's ahead. And I think um, Steve will now uh, talk to us about what that might look like. So please welcome Steve. <laughs> With 88% of the vote counted in Northern Metropolitan a few minutes ago, the Victorian Socialists are on 18,891 votes, first preference votes. That is the highest vote for a socialist ticket or a communist ticket on this continent since the Communist Party of Australia won 20,000 votes in the 1967 federal election. But that was a combined communist vote for a half Senate federal election. So we can safely say that never in the history of the Australian working class socialist movement has in one region or one district a socialist ticket got anywhere close to 19,000 votes and that's thanks to most of the people in this room. Thank you. At the moment, 19 parties stood, we're in fourth position, after the Liberals, after the Greens and after the Labour Party. Or to put it differently, of the 16 small, new, micro parties of which you could say we're one of, we were like a sheep in a wolf's den. 15 of them supported capitalism, one of them didn't. 15 of them did some type of dodgy preference deal, and one of them didn't. Many of them had a name designed to confuse or lie about their real intention, and one didn't. And of all of those parties, we came out on top. We got a vote. That's not normal for socialists in Australia. The party that came behind us 
came behind us on the basis of confusion. The Democratic Labour Party, in the context of a Labour landslide, most people who voted for them, shown by the fact that 95% of their vote was above the line, voted for them on the basis of confusion because they thought they were voting for the Australian Labour Party. Parties that came third to us and fifth to us unfortunately looked like, on the basis of these dodgy preference deals, that with a fraction of our vote, they will overtake us over the next day or two and win a spot one or two in Northern Metropolitan. When Patton won as the sex party leader in 2014, that fifth spot that we aimed for, she got 11,000 votes. Two weeks ago, the Hinch party got 9,000 votes. We are on basically 19, 18,800 votes and we didn't win. It's an absolute disgrace. People ask us, how do we feel? Three things. Number one, we feel cheated by the secret preference rules. The fact that your preferences, even if you want to give them in the first place, which you shouldn't be made to do, why would you want to vote for some capitalist party? Why would you not want to just put one socialist and not bother with anyone else? But even if you did want to put preferences, why would you want to hand over those preferences to some backroom deal, dealer in some dodgy party rather than do it yourself like you can do in other parts of the world? The second thing we, we would say is that we're very proud that we didn't sell our soul with some preference deal, some dodgy preference deal. And in the long run, that will do us a lot of good. The third thing, as Liz has said, and Colleen has said, is we're extremely proud of our campaign. What a machine we had. 95,000 doors knocked. 750 people on polling day. As one Labour MP said to me, you had what the Greens had 10 years ago. You had what the Labour Party had 30 years ago. You had the youth. No one else had them. It was an overwhelmingly young campaign where the vast majority of our people were the under the age of 30. Now, why didn't we win? Obviously, the first reason is objective. We do not have the level of class struggle in Australia that, for example, we're seeing right now on the streets of France. We do not have the level of, underst of, of understanding that socialism, no matter how broad you want to look at it, is in some way a, a, an avenue for social change that we're beginning to see in the United States of America. It's, it's as Corey Oakley put it at Marxism earlier this year, we're testing the water a little bit with this, uh, with this campaign. And, th and for that reason, we can be proud of the vote, but we're not at the stage yet. The, 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 the economic situation, it's not as pronounced, it's not as extreme as we see in Western Europe and in North America. Notwithstanding the fact that many people have been left behind by this 25-year boom here in Australia. On a more mundane level, the Greens vote dropped. That hurt us. They got 75,000 votes four years ago. They pretty much got 75,000 votes two weeks ago. But the number of people who were allowed to vote because of population growth in that seat rose by 60,000. So on a net basis, their vote went backwards. Why did that happen? Because of the contradiction that's inherent in the Greens. On the one hand, claiming to be some type of progressive to the left of Labour Party, but because they support capitalism, when they take control of a city council, when they go into a coalition government like they've done in Ireland, in Germany, in Tasmania, and other places, they sell out time and time again. And that's at the heart of the contradiction in the Darabin area between the councillors who are on the right, trying to manage a small wing of capitalism in Darabin Council, and the ones who aren't in power yet, who can afford to talk a bit left, and that's the inherent contradiction inside the Greens. The third reason we didn't win is that the reason vote didn't collapse. It actually went from 11,000 last time to 15,000 this time. Thanks, by the way, to unbelievable media support in The Guardian, in The Age, that the uh, reason party received. That makes our vote of 18,891 votes all the more remarkable. We garnished the anti-politician and anti-establishment vote. Four years ago, in that seat, there was a whole bunch of right-wing populists and religious nutjobs who tried to capitalize on the anti-establishment vote. The Palmer United Party, 5,000 votes. Family First, 8,000 votes. Australian Christians and Rise Up Australia, 7,500 votes between them. Thousands more for fake progressive parties. This election, we monopolized the left in that seat and the anti-politicians vote and the other parties had to flap around. We made the socialist name, the socialist brand, part of the mainstream debate. Without most workers realizing it, we gradually and persistently changed the perception. 
and the VS, the Victorian Socialists, became identified with housing affordability, with more public transport, with defence of public housing, and so on. We undertook for the first time in recent times on this country, semi-mass work. Hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of people read a socialist case on the main issues of the day that they face. The relative media silence that we face wasn't because of our irrelevance, but for exactly the opposite reason. However, it is still early days. Socialism alone, just that term, and even the term Victorian socialist, is still not yet attracting mass support, as seen in our low vote in seats where we stood outside of Northern Metropolitan. We, have, we, have, we had to have in Northern Metro an intense campaign to link socialism and voting socialist to the everyday needs of people. It's not, less, it's not obvious to ordinary people, but they are open to being persuaded. For example, in Yarra, my vote and the vote that the higher vote that the Victorian socialists got in the state seat of Richmond in the Yarra council area comes from being a socialist councillor for 14 years, rooted in the community that will answer you know, your emails and answer your phone calls, come to resident meetings on street corners and kitchen tables, and go into bat for you on whatever, every issue. But with the weakness of socialism in Australia, people think that that's some type of personal trait, rather than seeing as what any decent socialist elected representative would do here, and what your comrades would be doing right now, for example, in the Republic of Ireland, the TDs, and people before profit, and solidarity, and so on. This lack of clarity is a political challenge for us. It's also reflected in our vote where we got a very high below the line vote. A third of our vote was below the line. That's a, strength, a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. But we did drag the Greens to the left. There wasn't a day we didn't pick up the age almost where they'd stolen, sometimes with interest, our policies. <laughs> public housing, public transport, inclusion resign. They probably didn't even know what that meant before the election campaign started even on industrial relations. Everyone was claiming in this election to be on the left, to be progressive, and of course, it was a swing to the left. In 2014, the combined Labour-Green vote in that seat was 240,000 votes. In this election, the combined, in that seat, the combined Labour-Green and Victorian Socialist vote, with only 88% counted, wasn't 240,000, but 285,000. The Victorian Socialist is now, I'm proud to say, got 1,700 members and growing. The majority of those members are not in any other party, they're individuals. But we also have to be realistic. It's one thing to have an army on paper, but when you look at the army on the ground, we have to be realistic and we have to look at that with, with all honesty. The, the illusions that people had in Labour that we saw in the last, this last election campaign will gradually be eroded. We also see with the Greens, our major competitors still on the left or on the soft left, uh, at least with some of them, some of them would, would, need, would, would be horrified to be described as that. They are obviously in crisis too, notwithstanding their last minute win in Brunswick. We must not panic, we must not take opportunist temptations. This is not the same as the late 1990s or the 2000s, where new left formations were established, sometimes watered down the ideas of socialism, and every single one of them has made compromises with capitalism. Syriza at the extreme level, or compromises with nationalism. Here now in Melbourne today, we are the ones that wind in our sails. We are the ones with 18, nearly 19,000 votes. We are the ones with the machine. And that is why the provisional central committee, the provisional leadership of the Victorian Socialists a week or so ago announced that on the 9th of February, we're gonna have a conference to democratize this organization to ensure that we have a vote on our code of conduct, on our constitution, on our basic ideas, and elect a leadership. We are going to propose at that conference that we stand in the federal election. Why? Because if we abstain, we open up a vacuum. We know that nature abhors a vacuum. It's the same in politics too. We, we know we will not get the same vote as what we got in the state election for a whole number of reasons, but we have to ensure that the momentum keeps going and we don't leave, do all this hard work and other people will jump in if we don't stand. Also by standing in the federal election, especially if we stand in working class seats in the northern part of Melbourne, it will show that we are not a party of inner city trendies. Just by the way, in defense of inner city trendies, as the, <laughs> as the uh, councillor for Fitzroy and 
I've just heard from Liz, 18%. Who would have believed that the first Soviet in Australia would be in Clifton Hill? <laughs> you can't buy a house there for less than three million. But one of the proudest moments of this campaign, and there's so many things that I'm proud of, that we've all collectively done, was the so-called red bus. It was actually a white bus. It was the only lie that we told in this campaign. <laughs> Driven by Peter Green and your own Ros Ward, where we bust in people from public housing estates to vote. If you could have seen the look on the face of the Labour Party apparatchiks, I swear to God, you would have had a smile on your dial for 24 hours. But who was in those red buses? It, overwhelmingly women. Overwhelmingly people of colour. 100% working class. They not only wanted to get in that bus and travel the other side of Yarra to vote for us, not, not, you know, it wasn't a great bus and the driving was very good and all the rest of it, but it wasn't, you know, something that you would normally do. Why? Because over the course of the last decade and a half, when they've had cockroaches climbing up their house at 240 Wellington Street in those blocks of units to the degree where children were eating the cockroaches because they thought they were food, when they had a fire at 125 Napier Street Tower, when they had floods in that same tower a year earlier, when they wanted a basketball court because they had nothing for their kids to do. When they had the worst soccer field in Yarra, where all the kids play soccer in Fitzroy, and Clifton Hill had the best soccer field in Yarra, where none of the kids play soccer, or almost none of the kids play soccer. It was only the socialists and their own resident organization that got in the trenches with them. So the next time you get, you know, there's a lot of people on the left who like to criticize the Victorian socialists. Where were they when that was happening? We were there, we fought for those people, and that's why they rewarded us with their vote two weeks ago. We also want to stand in less than two years' time in the council election, which is not as boring as it sounds. There is a massive vacuum opening up in Yarra Council, also to a degree at Moreland and Darabin Council. Can you imagine if we had a majority of councillors on the left of socialists, and genuine community activists, we've already started the process of discussing with them, taken over, for example, in the case of Yarra, a $200 million annual budget, $1.3 billion in net assets. Can you imagine that would, for the first time, socialists be able to prove in action what they can do? We obviously also want to stand in four years' time in the said election, which to me right now seems like, uh, like the last thing I feel like doing, I've got to tell you. Um, <laughs> but I just want to say that one thing, on behalf of all those members of Victorian Socialists who aren't members of Socialist Alternative. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of all of us, a thank you. We never would have done this without Socialist Alternative. The organisation, the tactical nous, the, the drive, the hard work, the tenacity, it's a credit to your organisation. It's an unbelievable thing and it's a real feather on your cap. And I've got to tell you, there's thousands, hundreds of people out there, thousands actually, who are looking at socialist alternative in a different light now because they probably had different ideas until they actually could see in practice with this election campaign what you were like. We have created with Victorian socialists for the first time a party that's been taken seriously by tens of thousands of working class people. We're not just now, you know, ghettoed in the inner city or on the campuses. Not that that was ever true in the first place, but that was the perception. We are now perceived to be the, 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 a party that is the first up for public housing, for more public transport, you know, for, for housing affordability. It's a credit to everybody who's involved in that. We can only go from here bigger and better, starting with the federal election. Thank you for, 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 for um, coming to this session, and I hope to see you all on the 9th of February. Thank you. We're not going to wait for four, another four years. We're not going to wait another three years we are going to be out again in five months' time contesting in the federal election. In fact, we won't even be waiting five months. We want to be starting to build on the momentum of the state election to build an even bigger campaign with more volunteers, more people being active, knocking on doors, converting the people who maybe met us for the first time on November 24 when they came along and they had a chat to one of our polling booth volunteers. We want those people who for the first time two weeks ago voted for a socialist in the election 
to become Victorian socialist voters, by giving them another opportunity uh, to find out what we, where we stand and to support, uh, to support what we stand for. So we want all of you who haven't joined yet to join yourself. But for the most of us that are members, have been part of the campaign, who've been talking to people over the last two weeks about how much we've achieved, to talk to those people about what's next, that they should sign up, they should be with us when we're knocking on doors uh, in April and May, as it most likely uh, a May election um, is looming. So I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our last speaker, uh, Jerem Small. I was going to make a, um, well, I will be making a case for socialism. And in a lot of ways, it's not too hard to make a case for socialism when you spent a lot of the last month walking around one of the industrial heartlands of Victoria. A place like Broadmeadows, which is the residents of which and the workers of which have churned out the colossal profits of some of the biggest companies in Australia and some of the biggest companies in the world, like Ford. And when you wander around that industrial heartland, and the best that capitalism seems to have to offer them, here in Australia, the land of 27 years of continuous growth, here in the so-called lucky country, and the best that the system seems to be able to offer the working class of Broadmeadows is poison from the factory fires and mass unemployment, 25% of the workers chucked on the scrap heap and sitting there in, the, in many of the suburbs of Broadmeadows. And as soon as you turn your gaze from Broadmeadows, over the Maribyrnong to Footscray, and you see the inquiry starting there into yet another factory fire, yet another you know, bilious, poisonous cloud of smoke poisoning working class communities and plenty more across the western suburbs. And then you think just a couple of years ago, the Morwell fire, the Hazelwood fire that poisoned the town of Morwell and much further afield in the Latrobe Valley. Every cent of the wealth in this state depends on the labour that's pumped out of those workplaces and those communities. Every cent of the wealth in Collins Street is pumped out of those communities, couldn't happen without those communities, and the best that capitalism has offered those people for the last 20 years is mass unemployment and mass poisoning. And this is in Australia. 27 years of economic growth, let alone the rest of the world, that have been wrecked by crisis and all the rest of it. Many years ago, I put on a meeting, helped to put on a meeting, um, I think it was at Melbourne Uni, we found this alarming statistic, this incredible statistic, we couldn't believe it, we had to check it five times from Forbes magazine, that the richest 365 people in the world had as much wealth as the poorest three billion, three and a half billion, the, the bottom half of the population of the planet. Incredible, 365 people, not even a jumbo jet full. A few years ago, Oxfam redid those calculations and found 82 people now have as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. Last year, they redid the calculation again. 42 people in the world, not even a luxury bus full of capitalist parasites control as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's population. So it's not hard to make a case that we can do better than this. You know, we can't offer you a job, we can't offer you a pay rise, we can offer you a jail, we can offer you racism, you know, that keeps us divided, it's nice and cheap, that keeps us all in fear. We can offer you a crime, a, a crime, a crime scare, and that seems to be all that capitalism has to offer. So it's not hard to say we can do better than this, and that actually a system of socialism where the working class that produces the extraordinary wealth of this system that we can take hold of the incredible productive apparatus that spans the entire globe, that we can seize those means of production and that we can turn them into providing for human need, for human beings and, of course, into repairing the planet. Like, the idea that, you know, that this is a better state of affairs is not going to be too controversial. The hard part for a lot of people is believing that it can be achieved. The hard part for a lot of people Bertolt Brecht, the great German communist poet, put it as communism. That simple thing, so difficult to achieve. Like a lot of people would say, yeah, that's a great idea, it'll never happen. So we've got Marx learned from the workers, distilled and gave back to the workers' movement, what Friedrich Engels, Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, and all the rest. A theory of, uh, a, a body of theory which is built up to understand working class struggle, to orient in that struggle. And that's a body of theory that you know, we ignore at our peril. There are no shortcuts to political clarity. 
There are incredibly difficult political questions that come up, you know, even in all, in all sorts of campaigns. But we have that body of theory, um, you know, and that's, you know, to the extent that socialist alternative has achieved something in the world, it's because we've founded ourselves, um, you know, on that body of theory. So we've got that. And fourthly, and I reckon, you know, I don't know, most, well, yeah, fourthly, the capitalist system still produces resistance, and that resistance still takes the form of worldwide waves of revolt. And we've been talking about some of them this morning, you know. Um, I spent a fair while getting to 1848 um, uh, this morning. There's the, uh, the, the wave of struggles that, that, uh, that greeted the end of World War I, that, that gave birth to the world's first workers' republic in the Soviet Union. There's the wave of struggles in the 1930s. There's the wave of struggles that we're celebrating 50 years of, the 1968 struggles that shook uh, Western societies and, you know, societies around the world to their core. Even in my, um, you know, in those historic terms, even in my relatively short political life, I've seen um, the Stalinist tyrannies of Eastern Europe swept into the dustbin of history. Um, you know, and so many generations would have grown up thinking, oh, well, nothing will ever change in Poland, nothing will ever, okay. When it started changing, the dominoes fell almost overnight. And, you know, yeah, like, no one could have expected that. That was a wave of struggle. The, the anti-capitalist movement or the global justice movement that burst out from the streets of Seattle in, when was it, 1999, and caught the imagination of young people and trade unionists around the world. Um, it, you know, more recently, in response to the economic crisis of 2008, 2009, um, a vegetable vendor is humiliated one too many times in Tunisia, sets himself alight, it knocks into revolution in that country that spreads to Egypt. People in Greece are suffering austerity. They say, oh, well, people in Egypt just went and sat in the squares. That was enough to overturn the government. Let's go to the square. So the movement jumps across to Greece. It spreads across the Middle East. It jumps to Spain, from there to New York. There it becomes Occupy Wall Street and even reached sleepy old Melbourne, where we had a week of participatory democracy and all of its, you know, messy horrors down in the city square before Robert Doyle, the late unlamented Robert Doyle, the wannabe Caesar, sent in the, the riot squad with the dogs and the mace gas to chase democracy out of city square. Even that wave of global struggle even made it to Melbourne. Now we know that that next wave is coming. And we don't know when it's going to hit. We have no way of telling when it's going to hit. We don't know whether the uptick in strikes in the United States, the teacher strikes that some people heard about this morning. Uh, it's it's uh, actually a high of, uh, I think it's like since 2000, there haven't been so many mass strikes in the United States. We have no way of telling whether that's a flash in a pan and will die down or whether that will catch on and become something uh, even more significant. We have no way of telling the incredible uh, movement of the yellow vests in France you know, how far it will go, even in France, whether it will spread, what it will inspire. We don't know when the next global wave of struggle is coming, but we know that it is coming. And the question that we are going to be asked when it arrives is, are we ready? Have we drawn the right lessons? Have we built the right organisations? Now, there's a whole lot of debate that can happen within that. There's a whole lot of hard, bloody slog that has to happen within that. But every ounce of political clarity that we build before the wave hits, every ounce of organisation that we build before the wave hits is going to be absolutely crucial in those struggles to come. And we'll contribute to a day where they can get on their fucking luxury bus, all 42 of them, and they can take their barbed wire, and they can take their racism, and they can take their prisons, and they can take their crime scares, and they can go to hell, because all we want is the world, and we're taking it back. Oh.